you a particularly lot today because we are we did finish the first module, which was chapters one through three. And you have an exam due next week over those three modules. So what I thought I would do today is look at a couple of problems in section three, five Bayes theorem, and then introduce chapter four. And the first part of chapter four, the first section is really, really easy, straightforward. So we'll probably take a look at that. Um, I looked at the homework for sections three, 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 four, and three, five and Bayes theorem, and you're doing really well on it. Um, kudos to you, because those are sections that can typically, you can have a few issues with. But I thought we'd take a look at a couple of problems on that homework. And the first one I wanted to take a look at is the first problem. And this is a very typical Bayes theorem problem. And forgive me for covering up the answers, but I thought it would be way more exciting if we found the answers together. Um, but this is a typical Bayes theorem problem where you're either given um, probabil conditional pro probabilities and you have to find intersections, so probabilities of this and that, or you're given a conditional and at the end you have to find a conditional also. Okay, oh, well, look at that. I covered up the answers. <laughs> still there. I don't know if you noticed on this problem, that was a waste of my time. Once you type the answer in, it, it said what it's equal to. So I wasted my time covering those up because the answers are there. Well, let's, let's figure out the answers together. Okay, so in a contingency table, which is what this is, any kind of time you have a table like this, it's a contingency table. And each of these cells here, so this cell, this cell, this cell, and this cell are and probable or probabilities. So this cell right here represents that you have breast cancer and you test positive. This one, it represents that you have breast cancer, but you test negative. So you have breast cancer and you test negative. And then these cells down here, you don't have breast cancer and you get a positive result. Here, you do not have breast cancer and you get a negative result. And then these cells down here are just the totals of these. These cells over here are the total of the rows. Okay, so what do they give us in the problem? Approximately 2% of women aged 40 to 50 have breast cancer. So they give you the total of the first row. So approximately 2%, 0.02% of these women have breast cancer. So how many don't? 98%. So this total over here would be the 0.98. So those two values are given to you in the problem. <laughs> and the 0.98 comes from the fact that if 2% have this type of breast cancer, 98% do not. A woman has a 85% chance of a positive test result from a mammogram given she has breast cancer, a true positive result. Well, that's a conditional. So when, we're say, when we say we have this probability, given this probability already has happened, that's a conditional probability. So women that have this type of breast cancer, 85% of them test positive for it. Okay, so what, are they, what did they give me in that statement? Where'd my pin go? They give me that the probability that I have a positive result given I have this type of breast cancer, 0.85. Okay, and they gave me the probability of having this cancer, that was 0.02. So the probability of me not having this cancer is 0.98. So those are all things that are given to me. What else do they give me? 
um, a per a woman has a ten percent chance of a positive test result from a mammogram given she has no she does not have breast cancer. So this is a pause false positive. So this is. the probability that we have a false positive. So we test positive given we don't have breast cancer. So that's all the information that's given to me in the problem. So now to find the ands, to find these four probabilities, these four probabilities here, I'm going to use Bayes' theorem. And then the totals down here, I'll get from just adding those up. So you can see down here, the point 115 is just the sum of those two numbers there. The point 885 is just the sum of those two numbers there. Okay? All right. So let's find the probability that someone has this cancer and they test positive. And you could write this as positive in cancer. It doesn't matter. But it's this cell right here. So you have this type of breast cancer and you have a positive result, okay? So from Bayes' theorem, this is the probability of testing positive given you have cancer times the probability you have cancer. And that's straight from Bayes' theorem. Okay, and the way I always remember it is that the given here, I have to multiply by the probability of that. So this and this is the probability of testing positive given that I have cancer times the probability that I have this cancer. So they gave me all that information, right? Is that 0. 0.85 um, times 0. 0.2? Which is the 0. 0.017. Okay, so then we might want to find that one. That's the intersection of breast cancer and a negative result. So the probability of me having a negative result and, ha and having this cancer. So that's the intersection of a negative result and having the cancer. So negative result, but having cancer. It's the intersection. And you can even think of that, that cell is the intersection of that row and that column. So what's that going to be according to Bayes' theorem? That's the probability of me testing negative given that I have the cancer times the probability of me having that cancer. And they gave me both of those, didn't they? Did they give me that? Maybe they haven't given that to me yet. Where did I get that, Lisa? I love it when I look at my notes and I don't remember what I did. Okay, so if she tests, if the probability of her given a, getting a positive given she has cancer then the probability of her testing negative, given she had cancer, is going to be one minus that. So this is going to be 0.15 times the probability of having cancer, which is 0.02, is that right? So that's going to be the 0.003. Subtract from the total. You could. Table. Gee, you're so smart. I love it when people are smart. Would have been way easier, wouldn't it? Now, my method did. Yeah, my method worked because it checked. <laughs> no, that was way smarter than me. 
So if this is 0.017 and that totals 0.02, we could just subtract 0 0.02, 0 0.017 from 0.02. Way smarter way to do it. So you could also, eh, we haven't got that yet. Okay, what else do we know? Well, what's the intersection of not having cancer and a positive result? Right there. Not having cancer and having a positive result. Now, they did give me the conditional probability of testing positive if I don't have this cancer. So a, a false positive. And that's what? 0.1? So 10% get a false positive. If you've ever had a false positive, women, holy moly, like the worst thing you have to, go, then you have to go through the, all these other tests to find out it was a false, false positive. They're very worrisome that 10% false positive. Okay, but then from that um, conditional probability, we should be able to find that intersection. So I'm gonna erase a little bit of this so I have some room. So the probability, the intersection of no cancer with a positive result, I used NC for no cancer, is the probability um, of P given no cancer times the probability that we don't have this type of cancer. So they gave me that conditional probability of the false positive. That's 0 0.01, 0 0.1, excuse me. And what's the probability I don't have this cancer? 0 0.98. So is that 0 0.098? So now, and I like his, to find the next cell right there, take the 0.98 and subtract 0 0.098. Way smarter. I blame allergies. No, you have allergies too, so I can't blame those. Dang it. I'll try. Yeah, the allergies finally hit me. <laughs> finally hit me. This eye is all swollen and hurt. <laughs> All right, so then you can just add up the columns and you're good to go. All right, what's the last thing they ask us though? What's the probability a woman has breast cancer given that she just had a positive test? So we got Bayes' theorem one more time. So... The probability that a woman has this cancer given she has a positive result. And according to Bayes' theorem, the conditional probability is the probability of the intersection divided by the probability of the second thing. So we know what's the probability that we have cancer and test positive, that's the intersection of cancer and positive. So is that 0 0.017? Is that what we found? And the uh, probability of me testing positive was what? Right here, the 0.115, which is the sum of that column. So take 0 0.017 divided by 0.115 and do you get 0.1478? Was that helpful at all? For those of you who haven't done that problem, um, even though um, those of you who've done it, um, it had about a 50% correct rate. So there were several of you that had attempted it and got it incorrect. So hopefully this will help you as you rework that problem. 
All right, so this is the one that I mentioned on Tuesday. And again, I saw that the correct rate on this was about a half. So uh, I didn't look at each individual's attempt. I know a lot of you haven't attempted it yet. And a lot of you did get it incorrect. So I thought, well, this is a good one to take a look at again. Now, this is a problem where they give you a conditional in one direction and you have to find the conditional in the other. So you have to actually find the intersection so that you can use Bayes' theorem. So what they give you is the probability that you, uh, let's just read it. A survey reported that 66% of registered voters in California approved of allowing two people of the same gender to marry and have regular marriage laws apply to them. So this is the probability of all the California voters, they approved of this law. Okay, so 66% of California voters, voters approved. And then we have um, among 18 to 39 year old registered voters in California, 95% approved a gay marriage. So what they're saying is, if we now only look at voters who are between 18 and 39, the approval rate goes way up. And that should make sense. Younger voters are more likely to vote to approve this. But what you've done is you've reduced your sample space. You're now not looking at everyone in California who's registered to vote. You're only looking at those 18 to 39 year olds. So this is a conditional probability. only looking at the 18 to 39 year old registered voters. Okay, what else do they tell you? Well, they tell you how many voters in the state of California, registered voters are in this age category. They say 36% of California registered voters are between the ages of 18 and 39. So the probability of you being between 18 and 39 and being a registered voter in the state of California is 0.36. Okay, now what are they asking me? Out of the voters who approved a gay marriage, what percentage are between the ages of 18 and 39? So now you're only looking at the group of people who approved this measure or say they approve this measure. So now your sample space are only the people who approve it. And you wanna know out of the people who approve of it, how many of those are 18 to 39? So what you're looking for is the conditional, how many of those approved voters who approve are between the ages of 18 to 39. So you're looking, at, looking to find the conditional in the opposite of what you got. <clears throat> Okay, so what do you have to do? Well, this is going to be, according to Bayes' theorem, this is going to be the probability of both divided by the probability that you approve. So I know the probability that you approve. So I know 66% of the voters approve. So I know the denominator. What I don't know is the numerator. I don't know how many were between the ages of 18 and 39 and they approve. So in that contingency table, this is the intersection of people who are 18 to 39 and people who approve. So what I need to do is use the information they gave me to find that intersection. So I have, the probability that you approve and you're between 18 and 39. And you'll notice I wrote it in a different direction. It really doesn't matter. Um, this is equivalent to that. It doesn't matter if I write it A intersect 18 to 39 or 18 to 39 intersect A, isn't it? Okay. So according to Bayes' theorem, This is the probability that I approve given that I'm 18 to 39 
times the probability that I'm between 18 and 39. So that is Bayes' theorem straight from the formula. And again, I always remember what it is because whatever this given is, that's the probability I have to multiply it by. So I know all this, do I not? Is this 0.93? Is this 0.36? No, it's 0.95. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I got, when I took my handy dandy calculator out, 0.342. All right, so now I can figure out how many of these people who approved of this measure are between the ages of 18 and 39. So I'm just going to go up to the next formula. I'm going to take that 0.342 and divide it by the probability that they approve, which is 0.66. And what do you get? I get 0.518181, repeat. And they ask you in the problem to write this as a percentage, which should make sense to you that you want to write it as a percentage because the probabilities in the original statement were given to you in percentages. So what percentage is this going to be? 51.818, round off to, to uh, four decimal places. So out of the 66% of California registered voters who approve, 51% uh, of those are between the ages of 18 and 39. Questions? Typical Bayes theorem type statistics problems. All right. Chapter four is very important because this starts our discussion of probability distributions. And that's what we're going to spend the rest of the semester talking about. So we're going to start with discrete. Do you remember from, gosh, is this chapter one, chapter two? What's discrete data? Do you remember? I'm going to take a test in a few days. <laughs> what discrete data is. Maybe you should write this down on a note. <laughs> what's discrete? Okay, let's talk about what's continuous. Do you remember what continuous is? Never ends. Okay. So you got two types of data, discrete and continuous. One you count and one you measure. So which one do you count? Discrete. So discrete data is data you count. So this first chapter in our discussion of probability distributions are going to deal with data that you count. So it's going to deal with frequencies. Do you remember creating frequency tables? I mean, it's it, we're in the fifth week. So yeah, I know it's been a few weeks ago. But do you remember uh, creating frequency tables? For example, if I wanted to, what are some eye colors? Brown, blue, green, hazel, um, gray. So if I make those four categories and then I just count the number of you that have that attribute, that eye color, um, then I've created a frequency table. I've created a distribution. Um, if I just ask you what color car you drive, now most of you is probably going to be white. Isn't that the ubiquitous color that every car is white these days? Which which was what broke my heart when I sold my car to my daughter. Long story. Well, not a long story. He got rear-ended by a F-350 in a Nissan Altima. Guess what wins? when you get rear-ended by an F-350 and you're in a Nissan Altima. F -350. The F-350 had like a little scratch on its bumper. His car was obliterated. <laughs> you know, like, I'm not kidding. He had, cause he had a, he was a work truck and he had a big guard on the front of it. His poor Ryan's car was gone. So I sold him my car because you know how, do you, have you tried to buy a used car lately? <laughs> my parents did. Did they? Yeah, they somehow got, they got a used car for my sister. Meanwhile, I can't even drive because my car has been in repair for the past two and a half months. <laughs> well, 
when we went to look for used cars for them, um, my car, which was several years old, was worth more. Now, it's worth more now than when I paid for it, when I bought it brand new. Th three or what was how old is it? Four years. Four years used was worth more than brand new. Anyway, so if I ask you what, you, know, you can get me off on tangents. Um, if I ask you what color car you drove, then we could count the number of those of you who drive white cars, the number that drive red cars, blue cars, black cars, et cetera. And we could create a frequency table with those attributes. But it's data that we're counting. We're counting the number that do this or do that or whatever. Okay. So what we're going to do, we're going to first recognize and understand discrete probability distribution functions in general. So we'll define what they are and how they work. We're going to calculate and interpret expected values. Okay, this is the second section in chapter four. And recall that you can do this on your calculator. Your calculator can calculate the one variable statistics from a frequency table, correct? You can put your attribute in the first list and the count in your second list. And your calculator can calculate the mean, which is the expected value, and the standard deviation. It can do that for you. Um, we'll recognize, then we'll start talking about our four discrete probability distributions that we look at, the binomial, the Poisson, the geometric, and the hypergeometric. And the only one you can't do on your calculator is the hypergeometric. It doesn't have that function on the TI-84. But Excel does it quite nicely, and it's pretty easy to do with a formula. It's a pretty easy thing to calculate. Okay, so for example, a student takes a 10-question true-false quiz. Not that any of you would ever do this, but because the student has such a busy schedule, he or she could not study and guesses randomly at each answer. What's the probability of passing the test with at least a 70? Well, we can figure that out using the binomial distribution. I would suspect it's kind of, we can figure it out. Small companies might be interested in the number of long distance phone calls their employees make during the peak time of day. Suppose the average is 20 calls. What is the probability that the employees make more than 20 long distance phone calls during the peak time? We can figure that out using the Poisson distribution. These two examples illustrate two different types of probability problems involving discrete random variables. Hmm? Recall that discrete data are data that you count this is a definition you might want to write down. It's a definition that I include on the next few slides. What is a random variable? A random variable describes the outcomes of a statistical experiment in words. So it's a description of the outcomes of an experiment. So if I flip one coin, a description of the outcomes of that experiment would be I could get a head or I could get a tail. So my random variable is a description. I could get a head or I could get a tail. Now, if I do it multiple times and I count the number of heads or the number of tails I get, then I've counted the data. I've got a discrete value, okay? The values of the random variable can vary with each repetition of an experiment. So we use uppercase letters such as X or Y to denote a random variable. What's a random variable? Again, a random variable is a description of the outcomes of a statistical experiment in words. And then we use lowercase letters, X and Y, to describe the values that that random variable can take on. So big X, is a description, little x is a number. If x, capital X is written is a random variable, then big X is written in words and little x is given as a number. So 
So little x are the values that your random variable can take on. Okie dokie. For example, let capital X, the random variable X, be the number of heads you get when you tossed three fair coins. So it's a description of the outcome of getting three heads when you're flipping, or excuse me, when you the number of heads you get when you flip three coins. Let's put it out. So the sample space for this experiment would be you could get all tails. The first could be tail, then you could get two heads. You could get head, tail, head, 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 tail, head, tail, 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 head, tail, 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 head, or all heads. So what value can your random variable take on? So if my random variable describes the number of heads I get when I toss three fair coins, I could get no heads. That's the outcome, tail, tail, tail. Or I could get one head. That is the outcome, tail, head, head, or head, tail, tail. Or what's the other one? Tail, head, tail. Is that it? Is that the three? See, one head. One head would be here, here, and here. So uh, the number of getting, let me pause and regroup. The random variable could take on the number two because when you toss three fair coins, you could get two heads. The random variable could take on the number three because when you toss three fair coins, you could get three heads. So the least number that your random variable can take on is zero, no heads. The largest number is three because you're not gonna get more than three heads when you toss three fair coins. X is in words and little x is a number. Notice that for this example, the X values are countable outcomes, discrete, because you can count the possible values that capital X can take on, and the outcomes are random. The X value, the little X value, 0, 1, 2, 3, capital X is a discrete random variable. Discrete because you count the number of times you get that outcome, Random because flipping a fair coin, getting a head or tail is a completely random experiment. As long as it's fair, you have the same chance of getting a head as you do getting a tail. Okay, so let's do a little bit on discrete probability distributions and then we'll call it a day. So this is just a few slides. A discrete probability distribution function has two characteristics. So we went from talking about random variables. Now we're going to start our discussion of discrete probability distributions. A discrete probability distribution function has two characteristics. Each probability is between zero and one. So the probability that your random variable takes on a particular value cannot be less than zero or greater than one. So the probability that your discrete random variable can take on a particular value is between zero and one. The sum of all the probabilities is equal to one. So the sum of all the probabilities of your random variable taking on that value, the total sum has to equal the number one. And we get typically um, in this first section, we're going to get discrete probability distributions from frequency tables. And I think we talked about this early that we could look at a frequency table later by looking at the relative frequency and that describing that as a probability. That's where we get these discrete probability distributions. For example, this is a frequency table. It's a frequency table because we're just counting the times the numbers zero through five occur. Okay, so what does this data represent? A child psychologist is interested in the number of times a newborn baby's crying wakes its mother after midnight. 
for a random sample of 50 mothers, the following information was obtained. So capital X, our discrete random variable, is going to be the number of times per week a newborn baby's crying wakes its mother after midnight. And the values that this random variable takes on is the number of nights the mother told the psychologist that the baby awoke her after midnight. Okay, so it takes on the values from zero to five. So some mother said the baby never woke them after midnight and up to the largest number of nights awakened was five. Okay, so two mothers said that the baby never woke them. 11 said once, 23 said twice, nine said three times four said four times, and one said five times. So if we add this column, the frequency column, we're going to get 50. So our random variable is, as it says, the number of times per week. Uh, they were awakened to abbreviate. And little x is the value x can be. And this comes from our survey. So we had no nights, one night, two nights, three nights, four nights, five nights in a week. Okay, so from this data, we can create a relative frequency table. So do you remember how to find the relative frequency? What you do is you take the frequency and you divide it by the total. So the relative frequency for x equals 0 is 2 out of 50. 11 out of 50 is 1, 23 out of 50, 9 out of 50, 4 out of 50, 1 out of 50. So this relative frequency is the probability that your random variable takes on that value. So the probability of the baby not waking a mother at all during the week, 2 out of the 50 said that happened. So the probability of X being zero is two out of 50. So here is the probability table, the discrete probability distribution based on our frequency. So here are the values that our random variable can take on. It's the number of nights during uh, a week that a mother said her newborn baby woke her after midnight, and the probability that our random variable takes on this value is the relative frequency. So the probability that little x can be zero, the random variable can take on the value of zero, is two out of 50, et cetera. And what must be true is that when I add the probabilities together, I get one. What also must be true is each of these probabilities must be less than one or equal to one, less than or equal to one or greater than or equal to zero. So it has to be between zero and one inclusive. So if you get any number that's bigger than one or less than zero, it's not a discrete probability distribution. And that would occur you know, if you had a relative frequency larger than 50, then you got something wrong with your data. All right, let's look at this one. A hospital researcher is interested in the number of times the average post-op patient will ring the nurse during a 12-hour shift. 
For a random sample of 50 patients, the following information was obtained. So our random variable capital X is going to be a description of the outcomes. So that's going to be the number of times a patient rings the nurse during this 12 hour shift. So that's just a description of what we're looking at. For this example of 50 patients, the discrete random variable took on the values from zero to five. So the least number of times a post-op patient rang the nurse in a 12 hour shift was none. What a good patient. Or the most number of times in a 12 hour shift was five. Have you been in the hospital post-op any time lately? Any of you? Do you, how often do you see a nurse? Have you ever tried to call a nurse? That's why you have to have a human being staying with you the whole time. It's terrible. It's terrible. Anywho, that's enough of my, um, all of you who are going to be nurses are going to be way better than that. So P of X is the probability that X takes on any of these six values. Why is this a discrete probability distribution function? So what are the two reasons, what are the two criteria it must meet for it to be a discrete probability distribution? Each of these probabilities must between, be between zero and one inclusive. Is that correct? Are these all between zero and one inclusive? Actually, the way we could write this, let's use a, use a little algebra. The way we would write this is that our little variable X has to be between one and zero inclusive. So X is greater than or equal to zero, or it's less than or equal to one. Oops, that's P of X, isn't it? My algebra is messed up. There we go. So the probability that our discrete random variable can take on any of these six values has to be between zero and one. Are all those between zero and one? Yep. So none of those probabilities are less than zero or greater than one. So that criteria is met. What is the other criteria? That the sum of all these probabilities has to equal one. So what do we got? Four and eight is 12, 28, 42, 48, 50, 50 over 50, is that equal to one? So it is a discrete probability distribution because it meets the two criteria for that to be true. Suppose Nancy has classes three days a week. She attends classes three days a week, 80% of the time two days a week, 15% of the time, one day, 4% of the time, and no days, 1% of the time. Suppose one week is randomly selected to create a discrete probability distribution. Okay, so what is your random variable? The, 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 the percentage of, the percentage um, when she goes to class. Okay. So the number of days, because we need it to be a discrete number. We need it to, to be a number that we count. Let's talk about that a minute. <clears throat> they give us that the percentages, so they're giving us these are the probabilities. But our random variable must take on discrete values, values we can count. So the discrete random variable is going to be the number of days because that's what we can count. So this has to be something we can count. Okay, now what values can X take on? 
Well, she has a classes three days a week. She can attend no days, one day, two days, or all three days. So what values can her discrete random variable take on? Zero, one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. So this must be countable. This must be countable numbers, counting numbers. And what they give us in the statement of the problem is the actual probability. So X, zero, one, two, and three, and then the probability that X takes on this value. Let's write it like this. Okay, so what is the probability she doesn't go to class at all? Is that 1% of the time? Yeah. And then what, one day, is that 4% of the time? Yes. Yeah. And two days, and three days. Okay, are all of those between zero and one? So we're good there. And does that add up to one? Yes, yes it does. Questions? Go ye therefore and do your homework, do your review, study for your exam, and we'll see you on Tuesday. And we'll do section 4.2. Somebody, uh, did I have a few come in late? Did this one came in late? I, just, I got you. Thank you. What's your name? Uh, Gabrielle. Gabrielle and Jason. All right, thank you. Sorry, it's for free today. I, I wanted to get here. I wanted to get here like right on time, but well, you were pretty close. Mm -hmm. Um, on the homework that was due Tuesday, I missed one of the um questions that was like in words but it's just because I worded it weird like, so I have graded that so if it was reasonably decent you know there was one that said I don't know how I got this <laughs> that's not right <laughs> but if it was worded reasonably de decent I gave you credit okay so just, it might was, you might have credit for it now I I graded I this this morning I, yeah, I checked at the beginning of class and it still says I missed it, but I looked at the right answers. Oh, uh, let me go look at it again. And like there, it was like trucks in the U.S. and I like put the vehicles used in the United States that were trucks. So I put like 